Well, and as state power increases across the West, and as state power, state power still depends upon language rather than force because it's not totalitarian. Once you've got totalitarianism, uh, you can just shoot people and drag them off into camps and starve them and beat them and uh, do whatever you want to them. So it becomes, you still have to maintain the propaganda, but right now, uh, power hangs by the thread of syllables. And so because there's so much power to people who are verbally fluent and people who um, you know have that kind of verbal ability and agility, it draws them, you know, a lot of people are drawn into try and use that power, politicians and pundits, people on the media who can, you know, wave the wand of their tongues and summon riots or, or can't, you know, what they're saying now about what happened in Charlotte. Suddenly now 63 American Trump supporters are all racists because of a narrative. That kind of power is very heady. And I think it's given a lot of power to people who have very high verbal abilities, I would say well, low conscientiousness. That's certainly something that our detractors have been accusing us of. And it's a real danger, you know. And it, it, it is a real danger because whenever you have influence of that sort, you have to be very careful about how you wield it. And I've been thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not a real believer in the existence of the alt-right because I don't think it's, it's, it's not a political movement. And it's certainly not a political movement with power the same way that the organized radical left is with their, with their death grip on the universities. But I've been thinking, despite that, we can use that categorization for a bit. It's like, well, what should the, what should the so-called alt-right be concentrating on? And I would say, we don't want to have a war with the leftists. That's a bad idea. It's a bad idea to engage in that kind of polarization and demonization, because it's going to make things worse. What needs to happen is something like, and maybe this is the route forward with regards to individual individualists, is that, and, and this is why I've been trying to create and disseminate a narrative of personal responsibility. It's like, get your act together, straighten yourself up morally, take responsibility for your life, straighten out your families, find something productive to do, stop lying and doing stupid things, and see if you can live in a manner that would serve as an example to people who might not share your political predispositions. And, and I think that's a good thing. And I also think that the, the tendency of the people on the so-called alt-right to use humor has also been a really good thing mm. because humor is probably more effective than weaponry. Satire and joking, you know, it, it, it keeps things from descending into violence and, and it keeps everybody above the fray to some degree because at least the humorists are the sorts of people who can laugh at what's happening and detach themselves to some degree. And so I would really like to see it if those who were opposing the radical leftists didn't turn into the sort of alt-right demons that they're increasingly being characterized by. Because it, all we'll do then is repeat the sorts of things that happened, say, back in the 1930s in, in, in Germany and in the Soviet Union. I mean, I'm not, in, I'm not concerned about that at the moment to any great degree, because we're not in the midst of an economic catastrophe. But still, you think we could come up with a better pathway than the ones that have already been trod down. Well, and I, you know, I, I'm struggling to hold on to my belief that these issues can be solved with reason, evidence, debate, uh, language, and so on. Uh, people have to show up to the table to debate. If they show up at your riots with uh, plastic bottles filled with cement and they throw bricks and so on, it's a little tough to win a debate when bricks are flying through the air. So uh, the whole point is that if the left isn't going to show up to have conversations, if the left is simply going to attack and ostracize, uh, then uh, things are going to escalate. I mean, I say this not with any preference. I would desperately want it to go any other way. But uh, the left is going to have to show up and have debates. You know, I'm disappointed that this woman from Google didn't have a chance to debate with you. What a courageous and wonderful thing and civilization enhancing thing that would be to do. And um, yeah, because we I think could actually have a serious conversation about the problems. Yeah. You know, instead of this polarization, but because the, the, sorry, but the, just to finish okay. the alt the alt right, what they're doing is they're looking at the left and saying, well, they win. They win consistently. They, they dominate. They're getting their way. And how do they do it? Well, they do it through identity politics, through verbal abuse, through propaganda, through uh, random acts of violence. And the alt-right has been nonviolent for the most part. I mean, there was this uh, fellow in, uh, in Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, uh, the, the driver and so on. We'll wait to see how that shakes out. But the violence was occurring at the Trump rallies from the leftists. It wasn't occur occurring at the Hillary. Um, uh, but as long as everyone lets the left win, 
through propaganda, identity politics, through collectivism, then the right at some point is going to say, well, if, if that's what you have to win, this, univ this unilateral disarmament isn't going to work. And of course, uh, as long as that stuff does work, it's going to be very tempting for people to pursue it. So, okay, so, so a couple of things about that. I think I'm somewhat more optimistic on that front, certainly than I was a year ago. I mean, first of all, there's been a radical transformation of the formal political landscape in the United States. Right. I mean, the, the, the leftists have, have undergone a terrible routing, at least at the level of the elect, electorate. Now, you could still say, well, they dominate the micro, the, the micro power structures in many organizations. And I, I think that's true. But the fact that the but the fact that the elected official officialdom say has has the fact that the people who voted rejected the narrative of the left relatively wholesale, I think is a very positive thing. And then we also might want to point out that even though like my opportunities to debate people who are radically left have been zero because they won't do it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that what, what you and I are doing I mean, and many other people on, on, the, on YouTube in particular is actually producing a debate, not because we're debating people one-on-one -on -one, because that isn't happening, but because the debate is occurring in the public sphere. And so, you know, maybe we should be a little bit more optimistic about, about the possibility of continuing this at the level of discourse. I mean, I, again, I think that what happened with the Google memo, I mean, it was obviously appalling that he was fired, as far as I'm concerned. But I think it was also a terrible tactical error and an impractical maneuver on Google's part. And I really think they're being called out for it. You know, and so that's, it's hard to say it's hard to see how that isn't really good, even though he did get fired. I mean, it's not like he's been voiceless, for God's sake. He <laughs> wrote an article at the Wall Street Journal the other day. And I mean, and the New York Times, is at least the columnist there, has thrown weight behind him. And lots of scientists have come forward and said at least that he was credible. So I think that we also might not want to underestimate the power of the gathering opposition to the radical leftist narrative. And maybe also... A, alert ourselves to the possibility that the centrists who have been apologizing for the radical leftists might be waking up to some degree. So, you know, it's, easy, it's, it's really easy to get into a warfare mindset, especially when you're peppered on all sides with accusations about your sexism and your racism <laughs> and your transphobia and your, and your right-wing status. But if I step back, I think, Jesus, there's been a lot of discussion over the last year like, and a lot of it's really intense, and some of these issues do seem to be bubbling up to the surface. So, you know, maybe if we just hold our ground and keep, keep stating what, seem to be, what seems to be the elements of a proper counter-narrative, that we've got some chance of sorting this out without further degeneration. I mean, let's hope so, man. Let's that hope so. I mean, I think, I think in America, the urgency comes from the demographics, the idea that populations are wholesale being imported into America that generally vote for the left. And so this sense that uh, the debate is being cheated by the Democrats who want to import populations who are leftists, who don't generally come from cultures with small government, separation of church and state and so on, and no history particular of respect for capitalism, in fact, quite a contempt for it. So I think from, from, the, from the right, they're saying, okay, well, we don't have a lot of time because at some point we may just, like our preferences for smaller government may just be voted out from under us. And I think that's the urgency that they're well, feeling you know, at the moment. I thought about that a fair bit in Canada because there, there, there's, 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 it's definitely the case that immigrants to Canada tend to vote liberal, let's say. But I think that's partly because of the liberals, because of the liberal position on immigration, which is generally pro-immigration, say, across the board, which with some modifications. But, you know, the conservatives have done a bad job of reaching out to immigrants because most immigrant populations are actually socially conservative. Mm. You know, so there's, there's a huge alliance waiting to be made between the new immigrants and the conservatives, because like I would say that the typical, say, Southeast Asian immigrant to North America is far more conservative than the typical conservative, uh, you know, long term uh, inhabitant of North America. So the conservatives have made a mistake, I think, with their ethnocentrism to some degree. Now, it's complicated because I do believe that there, there, there is a limit to the rate at which societies can accept newcomers without forfeiting the stability of their own structure. I don't think we know what that rate is. But then 
By the same token, I think that it would be very useful for the conservatives to figure out how to talk to the immigrants to point out that although there are some values that they don't share, there are many, like the sanctity of the family, for example, and the insistence upon marriage and and, and a much more regulated attitude towards premarital sex and so forth, where the conservatives and the new immigrants are already, they're super tightly aligned. So I think the conservatives are missing an opportunity there. So that, that ha- I mean, that has been tried in the States to some degree, particularly with the Republicans and the history with the uh, Hispanic population. But um, data is, is hard to find that supports that as a productive strategy. And what Trump did, of course, arguably, is to win the election by ignoring immigrants and focusing on particularly what they call the flyover country, you know, the people in Pennsylvania who haven't had mm-hmm. a job in a generation and so on. So mm-hmm. if we're going to talk collectivism versus individualism, the kind of individualism that is the foundation of Western societies seems to be peculiar to the West. Uh, and uh, so that, I think, remains the challenge. And that's that's a tough thing to get into another culture, uh, because every culture, of course, views its own yeah. relationship between the individual and the collective as a moral thing. And morals, as you know, are the hardest thing to shift in another person's mind, which is why radical ideologies so often fasten themselves on moral principles. So as you yeah, point well, out, who knows when, who knows how much can be absorbed without change. But I think we're kind of close to that edge at the moment. Well, it's cert- certain people are certainly reacting as if we are, you know, and, and I think that that's a canary in the coal mine phenomena. You can't push unlimited immigration without facing a backlash. And at some point, the backlash is justifiable, although we don't know at what point that's the case. You know, and then underlying that, I think, is another complex issue that we can't intelligently discuss that you alluded to, which is, well, is the emphasis on the supremacy of the individual something that is truly Western in its essence? And if so, why? What's that grounded in? And is it truly valuable? And does it account, for example, for the overwhelming prosperity of the West compared to the rest of the world? I think you can make a strong case that the answer to that is yes. And then the next issue is, well, if those th- both those things are true, well, why are they true? And I would say Christianity, Judeo-Christianity probably put, put, put more broadly, is the reason for that. And then the next issue arises is something like, well, what do you do about the conflict then between our fundamental met- metaphysical system, the fundamental metaphysical systems of Christianity, say, versus Islam? And that's like a, or an absolute rat's nest and, and an impossible thing to, to have a civilized discussion about, partly because even if you do have a discussion about it, you're instantly threatened and seriously threatened. So, yeah, so that's, I mean, there's, well, so that's another major problem that's confronting the West that's very difficult to, to sort out and to, and to clarify. I mean, my approach to that at the moment, you, you probably know this, is I've been doing these le- lectures on the psychological significance of the biblical stories. And what I'm trying to do is to, for my own purposes, intellectual purposes, but also to the degree that I can communicate it, to return to the metaphysics of the Christian substructure of our culture and to try to find out exactly what the hell it is that's down there. Is it real? Is it solid? Can we rely on it? And if it's made understandable to people again, is it something that can strengthen the the spine of the West? Because, well, hopefully, because I don't see another alternative that isn't rife with conflict and catastrophe. You know, now it's a ridiculous ambition in some sense, but But, you know, whatever, if you can't see another way path, if you can't see another path forward, you choose the one that you could see. So, and then I think that's part and parcel of this idea that the the appropriate thing to do for the people who are appalled by the leftist collectivist narrative is to live their individualist life properly, deeply, right? Grounded in Western Western culture that they're conscious of and, and familiar with and manifest in their day-to-day behaviors and actions in a way that is profoundly respectable if you look at it from the outside. I don't see a, a better argument than, than living correctly, let's say. Well, and, and one thing that supports your argument, uh, Jordan, is that um, I think if I remember rightly, the statistics for immigrants into Canada is that Christian immigrants do five times better than non uh, Christian immigrants or refugees and so on, like if you're going to come from some place of conflict or some place of danger. And so the compatibility of Christians 
from the Middle East or other places is very high in Canada because it is, of course, a Christian country. It was founded on Christian principles and Christian individualism. I mean, Christianity, of course, says that the individual is responsible primarily to the ethics, to, to the virtues, to, to the, the goals and to God. The, the state is often viewed with great suspicion and rightly so. Of course, I mean, Christianity was founded on the state throwing Christians to lions, right? So um, this idea that you are responsible to your own conscience rather than to a secular power uh, I think is very powerful. And the other thing, of course, is that Christianity, through the concept of the soul and through the concept of individual excellence, allows for a difference in the conception of what it is to be human that mere materialism doesn't. Like the tallest guy and the shortest guy are pretty close in height, but the most moral and the most evil man are in completely different worlds, characterized by the myths of heaven and hell, both before and after death. And so the, the grand scope of human consciousness is encapsulated to me in the idea of the soul, and mere biological materialism cannot encompass the Pareto principle when it comes to ethics. Well, that's the that's the argument that's going forward, I suppose, you know, um, I mean, well, look, Stefan, we probably covered plenty of contentious issues for one day, I'm sure that it'll, it'll cause, you know, just exactly as much trouble as you might suspect. So since we talked about racism and gender and Christianity and ethnic differences and immigration, it's like, I don't know if there's any other sacred cows we can gore. <laughs>